<laughs> Hello, I'm Russell, and today I'm going to be talking about just one of the 70 million specimens in the Natural History Museum's collections. Now, I work on fossil insects and fossil arachnids, and that may seem, and I, I, trust me, I, I get this, it seems like a very esoteric subject. I hope in the next two or three minutes I can convince you that that's not the case. So behind me you can see some living examples of these creatures, and they're actually two incredibly important groups. Insects and arachnids make up somewhere between 65 and 85% of all known living organisms. They're incredibly diverse. Beyond that, they're incredibly abundant. They're central to virtually every terrestrial ecosystem. Without it, them, life on land would be very, very different. And they impact us directly as humans as well. For example, uh, they pollinate 85% of our crops, and also uh, they're vectors for a lot of really nasty diseases, including malaria, typhus, and uh, sleeping sickness. So they impact us directly. So that's why I think they're important. And I think they're also really, really interesting to work on. And that's for uh, several reasons, but first off, there are some really major unknown questions about these creatures. We have no idea, for example, of the origin of insect wings or spider silk, some of the most impressive evolutionary innovations in the history of life. Furthermore, on a personal note, relatively few people work on these, and especially, sorry, work on the fossil record of these, and the fossil record is a unique insight which gives us a direct idea of the origin and the e early evolution of these groups. So for that reason, I feel very privileged to be working on them. But if I'm going to be talking today about the fossil record, first I just want to give a tiny bit of context. So to start with, these were amongst the first animals on land. The, from the fossil record, we know the earliest members of both groups were on land by 411 million years ago. They probably made the transition from sea to land somewhere 30 to 60 million years before that point. By broad comparison, um, vertebrates, creatures with backbones, came onto land about 385 to 375 million years ago, so 60 million years after both of these groups. If we fast forward a bit to 250 million years ago, there was the greatest mass extinction in the history of life. Of all of the species living, 90% went extinct, and that irrevocably changed life on land. And sadly, before this point, we have relatively few fossils of land animals because there weren't that many rocks laid down on land. However, there is one, um, one small window where this isn't actually the case. Between 320 and 300 million years ago, there's widespread preservation of life on land in the form of fossils within a rock made of iron carbonate. And I've got some examples here, which I will ask my glamorous assistant to give out. If you can return these afterwards, that would be great. Um, so, during this time period, 320 to 300 million years ago, a number of conditions existed which helped this form of preservation. There were widespread forests around the equator, what we could accurately describe as the first true rainforest ecosystems, albeit the trees were made were more closely related to, uh, for example, horsetails and ferns than they were to what we think of as trees nowadays. It was a time of l fluctuating sea levels, and these were very low-lying forests. They were prone to rapid inundations of sediments, and every now and then one would be buried. And this would create the ideal conditions for the formation of coal and for the formation of a mineral called siderite, iron carbonate, which tends to grow out in round clumps, like the ones I'm handing around now. Often, this will precipitate out around a decaying organism. And over geological time, that organism will disappear completely, leaving a three-dimensional void within the rock that preserves its form perfectly. It's a fantastic and unique insight, and that's why this is uh, such a valuable time period for us, because it shows us those early terrestrial ecosystems. If we now fast forward in time, uh, 300 million years, in the intervening time period, uh, these forests have turned into coal. And if we go to the Victorian era, this coal was being dug up to fuel the Industrial Revolution in this uh, country. Furthermore, we're about coincident with the origin of paleontology, or the birth of paleontology in this country. There were lots and lots of gentlemen scientists wandering around spoil heaps of Victorian coal mines, collecting these fossils by the bucket load, giving them to collections, and they've been sitting there ever since. However, therein lies the rub. There is a problem investigating these fossils. As you can see, if you look at those, you can't tell what they are. They're three-dimensional. If you split open a rock using traditional techniques and just look at the surface revealed, all you get is a cross-section of that fossil. You, for, for example, elements such as the limbs and the body can remain buried within the rock. 
and that limits what we can say about both the fossil and about these terrestrial ecosystems. But using modern technology, we can try and overcome these limitations. So I use CT scanning to do this. So much like in a hospital, you use a uh, uh, CT scanner to create slice images using x-rays of people for diagnostic purposes. We saw one at the beginning of the first talk. I can use a slightly more powerful x-ray source and a high resolution machine to create slice images of fo a fossil from which I can create a three-dimensional reconstruction and try and extract all of their anatomy from the rock. And today, I'm going to show you just one example. It's from the Natural History Museum collections. It's 312, or well the fossil is 312 million years old, and it's been reconstructed with a CT scanner. And it was the first fossil I CT scanned to test if this technique would work on fossils like that. And so, if we move over to this visualization table, we've actually loaded the fossil up onto here. So this is an extinct group of arachnids. They're closely related to the spiders, but they're not true spiders. And what you can see here at the moment is we've had to crop off digitally the side of the rock, but this is just a rock, one like the one of the ones you're seeing. And this is the crack along which it was originally split. But that didn't tell us all that much about what was inside it. We could see there were some legs and a bit of an abdomen. That was about it. However, if we create a 3D model by mapping the air within the nodule, within the rock, we can get a lot more information out. So this is just the air within the rock, and you can see that actually all of those bits that were buried within the rock, we can now extract. It's really fantastic. Trust me, this is when I saw this, I was so pleased. That was my PhD right there. I spent the rest of the time just scanning these fossils. <laughs> so if we start off at the back here, this is a structure called the pagidium. It bore the anal opening in life, but what's important is there are no appendages there for spinning silk, which is what spiders have, showing these didn't spin silk, and they're not true spiders. Furthermore, you can see we got the limbs out, and that's lovely. And even just up here, you can see there are some fangs tucked under the front of the creature. Really fantastic insights. But what really, really excited me about this fossil, it's brilliant, are these front limbs. So if you can see these front limbs, oops, my apologies, I'm just cutting them off there. There we go. They're actually rotated around so they can be held out in front of the creature. This is a stance we see in modern day crab spiders, which are ambush predators. They sit on the edge of a flower waiting for an insect to fly by and grab at them with the modified forelimbs. So by comparing this fossil with living species, we can say that this 312 million year old arachnid was likely to be an ambush predator. So far, so good. Awesome. However, as I said, I spent the rest of my PhD scanning more of these fossils, and I actually scanned another one of the same arachnid group, um, and I've used a 3D printer to create a 3D model of it. I'm not going to hand this one out because it's incredibly delicate. However, do come and have a look at it afterwards. However, hopefully you can see that this is a really, really spiny creature. The entire abdomen is just covered with spines. And this is a defensive adaptation. So the idea is it makes it less palatable to any range of creatures that may be eating it. And why I find this so interesting is that these creatures, when they're uh, in the 411 million old fossils we know of them, they're actually the first land-based predators. They were top dog of the food chain. Clearly, by 100 million years later, this is no longer the case. This creature is developing spines, and another one of these creatures, which we've just seen, was developing ambush predation, a defensive adaptation that allows it to spend most of its time in hiding and only come out for food. So I think that's fantastic. It's telling us something about the ecosystem as a whole. And also, I don't think it's surprising that these arachnids actually went extinct 290 million years ago. That's just one example, however, of, I th of how I think CT scanning can help us. And I believe that it could, hopefully in the future, it could be used throughout the South Kensington institutions to tell us a lot more about the uh, objects, because the problems we have with this are by no means rare. Many of the uh, different objects in the South Kensington collections are, are three-dimensional, and almost all of them are rare, making destructive approaches such as dissection distinctly suboptimal. With using this, we can overcome those limitations, and hopefully in the future we can apply them to a wide range of specimens, from the anthropological to the zoological and from the natural world to the man-made, to try and tackle some really big questions, such as the uh, not only the origin of insect wings, but, for example, how things react to climate change and human evolution. And I just want to finish by saying I think this is a fantastic example of the importance and the power of collections. Had you asked the curators here 40 years ago if there was anything more to say from these collections, they probably would have said no. 
Clearly there is. And the Victorian gentleman scientist that collected the fossils I've shown you today did so 50 years before the discovery of x-rays. They had no idea these could be used in this way in the future. And that's really fantastic. So to conclude, I want to say that the museum has changed a lot in the last 131 years. But the collections have weathered that transition incredibly well. I, the Victorian gentleman scientist can tell the future, and nor can we. So I think we owe it to future generations to not only look after the collections, but to continually reassess what we can say through their study. So thank you very much.